Throughout history, groups and teams have formed to accomplish many tasks, from foraging, survival, and combat. But an age-old wisdom is present in all gathered groups. A team is only as strong as its weakest link. Jean Arc, the knightly leader of Team Juniper, versus the vehicle destroyer. These two, despite their problems and deficiencies, have both risen to every occasion and emerged better for it. Now, let's see if one of these two can overcome the other. Now, just to point out a few things. Since Volume 5 of Ruby has come out and we finally get to see Jean's semblance, I will be finally able to complete his character bio sheet in the Gaming Glorious Combatant database. And yes, I'm working on putting that together. Also, in Red vs. Blue, considering that there are 15 seasons of that, there will be some things that are ignored. Most notably, Season 9, as it takes place within the memory unit and is therefore not valid as a reliable source. I will also be continuing what was done in the Albert Wesker vs. Alex Mercer fight in an attempt to streamline the information presented to you. Jean was a man born into expectation. As a descendant of a war hero, he had a massive shadow to climb out of. There was only one problem. Unlike all of his peers, Jean did not attend a combat prep school prior to entering Beacon Academy. So essentially, he was starting out years behind literally everyone else. But he managed to get in with the assistance of false transcripts. So he was well on his way to becoming a hero. But, he ran into another problem there. He sucked at combat. During his time at Bacon, he became a team leader, had his transcript secret used against him by a bully, began to train under his partner, Pira Nikos, participated in an inter-school tournament, had to watch his school be destroyed, learned that his partner had been killed not long after she revealed that she liked him, and after all of this, went off with his friend, Ruby Rose, to Haven. Eventually, he made it there, awakened his semblance, and kinda got revenge on Cinder Fall, the one who killed Pyrrha, when Yang's mother defeated her. All in all, a fairly interesting life. Caboose, like all the Blood Gulch crew, was stationed there for good reason. Like his fellow soldiers in that box canyon, he was a pathetic soldier. Assigned to the blue team, he participated in the various hijinks and adventures that went on in the canyon. He killed his team leader, Church, within a very short time of meeting him, assisted with stopping a few universe-conquering plans, helped put an end to Project Freelancer and, by extension, stopping their Frankenstein monster, the Meta, assisted with saving the planet Chorus from a civil war, and stopped a group of evil blues and reds from destroying the Earth. Now, this is a very brief overview, I know, but if I were to try and give a full pack story, that would be its own full video. And right now, we need to start getting into the comparison of these two characters. We will start with Jean's advantages. First, in the category of mind. Now, if you know about Caboose, then you know he has been outright described as the blue being in Nodino has a stupidest life form in the universe. So it's no surprise that Jean gets the advantage in intellect, even though Jean is average in that field at best. Furthermore, Jean also gets the edge in strategic inclination. He's known for his very clever on-the-spot planning, and the fact that his plans have such an astounding success record does speak for itself. However, the category of mind is not quite as clear-cut as you might think. Caboose does make a comeback in regards to his personality and experience. Psychological balance is a very interesting similarity between these two. They are both devastated individuals. Jean, through the death of Pyrrhonikos, a death he was completely incapable of preventing or interfering with, and Caboose through the loss of the Epsilon AI fragment. 
Now, the big difference between the two of them is that we get to see that Jean has not come to terms with this by the time Volume 5 comes around, considering how he charges at Cinder despite her obvious advantage over him. Caboose, on the other hand, does come to terms with this at the end of Season 15. He has come to terms with the fact that Church isn't coming back. Jean is still working on doing the same. Now, people will ask how personality factors into this, and the answer is simple. Jean is known for having issues with his confidence, as well as having self-doubt. He always, to some degree, has a kernel of doubt in his abilities, and this causes that tiny bit of hesitation, that split second that a skilled opponent can capitalize upon and take him out. Caboose has none of this, and in the Chorus Trilogy, we get to see that he actually has no fear, no negative emotion at all. Obviously, if you push him hard enough, this changes, but typically it's not the case. And a quote from Deadliest Warrior that really stuck with me and I think really applies to this. They were talking about it in regards to armor, but they said that if you don't have to worry about what your opponent's going to do to you, you can focus upon what you're going to do to them. And I think that this applies to personality as well. As Caboose, will go in without any kind of hesitation holding him back, but Jean cannot say the same. Now, just as Jean outstrips Caboose in regards to strategic inclination, Caboose outstrips Jean in terms of experience. Jean has only faced Grimm, though many are quite formidable, a few rival huntsmen while in training and combat class, and one team during the Vital Festival. It's estimated that he has maybe a year of training and combat experience. Caboose, on the other hand, has years of experience. He's faced off against the Reds from Blood Gulch, the Reds and Blues of the other maps, the Omega Possessed Doc, aka O'Malley, enemy forces on Chorus, and most importantly, an army of Tex androids. The sheer breadth of his experience, seven years according to some of the enemies in Season 15 is far more impressive in Caboose's corner than it is in Jean's. Now, while the edge in mind is far closer than I originally thought, Jean still gets a marginal edge. Caboose's experience and personality advantages weigh less than Jean's intellect and strategic inclination. So while it's not as much of an advantage as I originally thought it would be before going into the research, the mind edge goes to Jean. Now, the next advantage in Jean's corner is special abilities. Caboose's universe does not have special powers, at least not ones that don't require armor enhancement and an AI to operate. Jean's universe, however, has aura and semblances. Aura is a manifestation of a person's soul and can provide increased defensive and healing abilities, though there are those who can use it to increase their physical performances. Semblances, however, are unique abilities that vary from person to person. Now, Jean does not have quite as much experience with aura or his semblance as many of his peers, as his aura is very untrained and his semblance has only made, so far, two actual appearances. Now, as I've said, the actual reveal of Jean's semblance allows me to complete his combatant datasheet. Now, his semblance seems to be very similar to the abilities of Mercy from Overwatch. However, instead of boosting the offense and healing such as Mercy, he boosts the passive healing and defense of Aura, even able to do this on his own Aura. Basically, it's almost as if his Aura supercharges other Auras, which, considering his amount, makes him a very interesting support specialist. Now, something to point out here. It's actually addressed that the defensive aspects of Aura are active, whereas the healing aspects are passive, meaning that you have to actively use your Aura as a shield if you want to do so, but you don't have to actively use it to heal yourself. So basically, what Jean was doing with Weiss was pretty understandable. He was basically just empowering her Aura to do what it was already passively doing anyway, Whereas, as what he did in Forever Fall, was an unintentional active action, empowering his aura's defensive abilities 
though only doing it by accident and a stretch of the definition of active action. But yes, that's his special ability, finally. Now, while Jean has his aura and semblance, there is a certain degree of unreliability to them. For example, he's not very well practiced with aura, so he's not very skilled at using the active abilities that it bestows. However, hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to see Jean actually practicing with both of these skills in order to become more practiced with them. As it stands right now, it's speculative to say that he'd be able to actively use his semblance in combat just on a whim. I'm strongly suspecting that what Jean did with Weiss was a stress-induced situation, and it would actually take training to accomplish the same feat without the external stress factors. But that is just a theory on my part, that is just speculation on my part. We don't know enough about it just yet. As such, I do feel confident though in awarding Jean the edge in special abilities. Now we cover Caboose's advantages, starting with his equipment and weaponry. Caboose is equipped with Mjolnir Mark V armor, a battle rifle, and a magnum pistol. The armor has an energy shield and can take a very good blast. It can still be overcome by standard equipment of other similarly armed individuals, but its defenses cannot be underestimated. Now Jean is bringing his armor medium plate being a good description, that has been improved with metal from the armor of the late Pyrenikos. He has a shield, similarly improved, and his ancestor's sword, Crocia Moors, probably messing up that pronunciation. Of note, the shield can become either a sheath or an addition to the sword. It can fold around the blade and essentially turn it from a long sword into a broad sword, which is useful if you need to add a bit of extra heft and weight to a sword strike. Now, while Jean's armor is durable, his shield strong, and his sword versatile and deadly, he's still ultimately a close range fighter. Caboose has armor that, in the words of Private Simmons, You're wearing state of the art biomechanical body armor. It's designed to deflect bullets and absorb explosions, and firearms capable of both mid to close range use. So it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that I give the edge in equipment and weaponry to Caboose. Which now brings us to Caboose's greatest advantage. Now Caboose, like Jean, is a sort of secret weapon. However, whereas Jean leverages this through incredibly effective strategic calls, Caboose does this through sheer physical supremacy. Just to list a few things. In Season 5, Caboose transported a bomb created by Agent Texas who herself wasn't strong enough to carry it. This is the same Agent Texas who, in Season 1, flipped a Scorpion tank. Now, the actual Halo website describes this tank as easily weighing 30 plus tons. Now, I can acknowledge that there are some extenuating circumstances surrounding this. First, the tank was damaged. Now, following typical game mechanics, a damaged vehicle weighs less than a perfectly intact vehicle, meaning that the tank was probably a lot easier to flip in Season 1 when it was damaged than it would have been if it had been in prime condition. 2. At the time, Agent Texas had the Omega AI. This means that, in all likelihood, she was much stronger at that time than she was in Season 5 when she was hunting Omega. But it is still worth noting that Caboose was strong enough to pick up a device that Agent Texas outright said, you're gonna need at least two people to carry. That's very impressive to me. Now, two more feats to really hammer home Caboose's strength. In season 10, he went up against, alongside the other Reds and Blues, an army of Agent Tex robots. He charged into these robots and sent at least two dozen of them flying. Now, while he was Surrounded by these robots, he battered a few around and then uppercut one so hard it left the ground. Several feet off the ground. 
Now, it's been stated that a Spartan wearing Mjolnir armor in total weighs about 1,000 pounds. Now, that's a human, albeit a big human, with improved musculature and bone grafts stuck inside this suit. So you can imagine what it would be like if you essentially put a Terminator around the size of a Spartan inside a Mjolnir suit, how much more that would weigh. But for the sake of a conservative estimation, we're going to stick with 1,000 pounds just to make things simple. That is still an insane amount of weight for a person to punch and send skyward. Furthermore, in the Chorus Trilogy, Caboose, upon entering an alien simulation, experienced a 10 time increase in gravity without noticing. That is some Dragon Ball Z training room kind of stuff, and Caboose took it without noticing. In regards to pain tolerance, Caboose has a number of feats to his name as well. At one point he had half a gallon of blood drained at once. Now that equals about four pints, or almost half the blood in a human body. Now, fun fact, Four pints of blood being drained is considered lethal blood loss. Little fun fact for you. In season seven, he fell hundreds of meters. Now, yes, he hit sand, but one, he was propulsed by a landmine. Two, we didn't hear any landmines by the time we saw Griffin Simmons hit the side of the behemoth, so it took at least a minute for Caboose to be sent up, reach the peak of his arc, and then come back to the ground. And three, sand, like water, is not a good thing to belly flop onto from hundreds of meters up. And finally, one feat that I can actually mathematically calculate was in season 15, when Caboose fell off of a cliff, and in the next episode admitted that he landed on his head. Now, assuming that the planet's gravity is equal to that of Earth's means that the 3.5 second fall equates to a roughly 60 meter fall onto... Now, Caboose's other physical traits, such as speed and prior injuries, don't really factor in very much. He is in his physical prime, and he does have a number of head injuries that have caused him to become detached from reality but that's something evaluated in mind where we've already reached our verdict. Now, the thing is, while his opponent, Jean, is very impressive in regards to real life people of his age, he's not impressive compared to his peers. Jean in his teens is at a point where most people in their late twenties strive to be. And while it is very impressive and while he is capable of performing feats that normal humans would be in incapable of doing, he's still a fairly average human. Now, I will agree that Jean's reflexes are greater. Now, that's something that I will not deny. But there's something interesting about Caboose there. In combat, his reflexes aren't that bad. Like, he sharpens when he gets into a fight. As such, it should come as no surprise that I give Caboose the edge in physical ability. Now, something that I typically gloss over in other versus matches that I might end up making its own dedicated category for is combat ability. And I might end up making a fifth category just to cover this, but we're gonna go ahead and start that right now. In regards to Jean, it'd probably be easier to discuss his defensive and offensive abilities. In regards to defense, he was able to deflect a Deathstalker strike in the first volume, and then also deflect a paw strike from an Ursa, basically a Bear Grim. Now in both these cases, he was smart enough to know not to get into a direct contest of strength. He knows he can't win that, so instead he'll redirect the attack then flow into the opening in order to counterattack. And on the subject of attacks, his offense is actually pretty impressive. He was able to decapitate that very same Ursa I just mentioned, 
and later on in the series, while training to a training video sent to him by the late Piranikos, he was able to swing his sword so hard that he created a small air current that ruffled the grass for several meters. While he's not very impressive in regards to his peer group, it should be noted that his peer group all have at least 10 years of experience. Well, in the case of most of them anyway, Ruby is an obvious exception. In regards to Gaboose, it would probably be easier if we discuss his hand-to-hand -hand skills and then his marksmanship. We've already seen his hand-to-hand -hand abilities in the Tex Android fight. Obviously, if you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of a Jean Arc sword swing, you definitely don't want to be on the receiving end of a Caboose punch. In marksmanship, I have two feats to discuss. First was the sniper headshot Caboose did on a possessed Sarge early on in the series. Now this was when Church had possessed Sarge in an effort to free Agent Texas from Red Team capture. Caboose, thinking that Sarge had managed to capture Tex again, decided to shoot Sarge in the head from a considerable distance, a feat only matched by someone like Locust during the Chorus trilogy. Furthermore, in Season 6, Caboose was the main contributor to Agent South Dakota's capture. Now, you have to actually watch the clip and time it to see how impressive this feat is. Caboose, upon getting tricked by Church to shoot at South, popped his head up, found his target, raised his rifle, took aim, fired, and hit South Dakota in the space of about one second. And most of that second was spent watching South get hit. Less than half a second for Caboose to pop up, spot, aim, fire. This is a skill with marksmanship that the rest of the Reds and Blues, and even some freelancers, have never displayed. And it's certainly an advantage in Caboose's corner. Now, before Volume 5, I would say that Jean would have had a great amount of difficulty with Caboose. But with the actual awakening of his semblance, Jean does have an opportunity. However, the fight would still not be easy. I see it starting off long range, Caboose opening fire, but Jean, at some point having undoubtedly been shot at during combat class, would block an approach. Now when Jean got close, he would run into an issue. Jean might be geared for close quarters combat, but Caboose's armor and physical abilities make close quarters combat with him a very, very bad idea. And unlike Captain America, Jean wouldn't be strong enough to still be standing if Caboose punched Jean in the shield. Now at this point I see the fight dividing into two possible situations. If Jean can use his semblance and then uses it on himself, he can beef up his defenses after fixing himself up. Now if he can maintain this, Jean can wear Caboose out by essentially letting Caboose hurt himself against Jean much like Cardin did. And then after a long enough period of time, when the opportunity presents itself, he would strike Caboose down. But if he can't, then Jean's in trouble. Unless Jean can hit one of the really vulnerable parts of Caboose's armor, then Caboose can really beat up on Jean. Now, I would liken Caboose to a really slow, dumb version of Yang. You can dodge, you can get your own hits in, but any hits that Caboose lands aren't going to be recovered from easily. But Jean still has the advantage of Aura which would fix him up, and basically let him fight on until Caboose leaves himself open for retaliation. One thing to cover here though, is that it essentially becomes an interesting war of attrition. As long as Jean's Aura remains abundant enough to heal him after anything that Caboose lands, Jean can win this eventually. But that relies upon the idea of Jean having enough aura to keep going and match with Caboose's physical ability. A war of attrition between Jean's aura and Caboose's strength. However, in most of these situations, I honestly see the aura as being able to hold out longer than Caboose can. 
And as such, I declare that Jean Arc is the winner. Now, of interesting note here, if Caboose fought any of the other seven of Team Ruby or Team Juniper, Caboose would die in seconds. Jean only wins this because his abilities make him a difficult opponent for someone like Caboose. Against most of the Blood Gulch crew, Jean could probably win with some effort, with the exception of Agent Washington, Agent Carolina, and possibly Tucker. Another fun fact, Tucker was actually a potential opponent that I considered for Jean after starting this research, but since I felt this matchup was more thematically relevant, I stuck with it. Now, just to do a quick recap, Jean took the mind category by a narrow margin because he was more intelligent and more strategically inclined. But Caboose's larger breadth of experience means that it was a very close matchup, but Jean still took a marginal advantage there. Jean took an overwhelming advantage in special abilities by virtue of having aura that Caboose doesn't, having a semblance, also Caboose doesn't, having an impressive amount of aura, and having an incredibly interesting semblance. Jean using his semblance on himself like he did in Forever Fall essentially makes him untouchable so long as he has aura to spare. Now in regards to Caboose's advantages, his weaponry allows him to attack from much further ranges than Jean's weaponry does. In addition, his armor protects him better than Jean's armor protects him. Anything that tries to attack Caboose will end up getting a face full of lead from either his rifle or his pistol. And even if they do get close enough to actually start trying to attack Caboose, they're going to find out the hard way that you don't want to be on the receiving end of a Caboose punch. In regards to Marshall's skill, it's a very interesting stalemate that we come to. Despite the limitations imposed upon him by both his skills and equipment, Jean has acquitted himself fairly well. He is a fairly skilled close range fighter. However, this is a bit of a problem against his opponent. Caboose, as I've said, is able to address medium and long range offense with his weaponry, something that Jean has no choice but to either dodge or block while he makes his advance. And furthermore, since Jean's weapon is a melee weapon, he has to get close enough to use it on Caboose. If you're close enough to Caboose to swing a sword at him, you're close enough for Caboose to swing his fist at you. Jean's only available option for offense puts him in the exact same space as Caboose's greatest advantage. And this is why I have to give the edge in martial skill to Caboose. All right. So this project was a bit rushed. I've been busy with my work and trying to juggle this with an actual job is not easy. But I wanted to get this video out in time for Monty Um's birthday. That man was an icon at Rooster Teeth and he will always be missed. His work on the various shows I've watched is top notch. This video has been made in honor of him. Rest in peace, Monty Um. Keep howling, Wolfpack.